So uh, for our next lecture, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Nalini Balbir. Professor Balbir is, from, is a renowned professor of Indology at the University Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris, where she has taught Sanskrit and Middle Indian languages such as Pali and Pakrit. Her research spans the entire spectrum of the Jain traditions and its various developments. As the chief editor of the Jain Universe Online, Professor Balbir's expertise and papers have been recognized with numerous international awards. In today's lecture, we will delve into the world of illustrated manuscripts with Professor Balbir as she shares colorful photographs of 17th century Jain manuscripts from a private German collection. Through this exploration, we will learn about the story of Prince Simhala, a narrative poem composed by Samaya Sundra, a 17th century Jain monk, that emphasizes the virtues of generosity and caring for others. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Nalini Balbir as she takes us on this captivating journey. So first, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction and thank you very much for the organizers and to the team of volunteers who was very active, as we know from the WhatsApp group they created. So this was a very nice experience. Uh, so today's presentation is meant to draw attention on the richness of Jain culture in its various components and to explore the ways visuals and narratives support each other to transmit Jain values in ways that are both entertaining and efficient. Illustrated manuscripts have been an important media since they are available to us from the 11th century onward, whether on palm leaf and then on paper or cloth, as Dr. Kalpnashet will explain in more details. There is evidence in the past and in the present that some of these documents were indeed shown to audiences in temples on holy days or on specific festivals in an atmosphere of both serenity and joy. I will focus uh, on the story of Prince Singhala as told in Gujarati in 1615 AD. This work has been copied very often without interruption. Indian scholars report that several illustrated manuscripts of it are available. They are, however, not easy to trace and to get hold of. Hence, the one I will show you today is not without significance. It has no date, and I find it difficult to identify the school of Western Indian paintings it represents or to date it on the basis of stylistic features. I would suggest the late 18th century as a possible period of production of this artifact. This story has a rather famous author. Samaya Sundar was an eminent 17th century figure of the Shwetambara monastic order known as Karataragat. He primarily wandered and stayed in Rajasthan and stands out as a prolific writer in three languages. He composed works in Prakrit, Sanskrit, as well as in the current idiom of his time and region, a language combining Gujarati and Rajasthani features. He also resorted to various literary forms, selecting them in agreement with the language he used. He was able to write in sophisticated or simple Sanskrit, drew on canonical scriptures in Prakrit when he wanted to discuss points of monastic conduct, but he also wrote several verse tales in Gujarati which are quick-paced stories in a lively poetical style that makes delightful reading. The Singhala story is one of them. Here, you see the last page of the manuscript. The Jain monk of higher rank, seated on a high seat, um, with a manuscript placed on a stapanacharya in front of him, accompanied by two junior disciples seated on the ground at a distance, I suggest might be the author. It is, of course, not a life portrait, 
but having the author of a work shown at the end of a manuscript is fairly common. Here, he receives homage from laymen and laywomen and from a nun. This is the depiction of the Chaturvidha Sangha fourfold community, and such standard scenes are at, at the closure of Jain manuscripts are like a final mangala. The two lines in red on the left of the picture are interesting. They contain the name of a monk, a certain Rupa Vidya. For various reasons which I cannot discuss here, I venture to suggest that he was both the person who copied the text and who painted the illustrations. And please do not be shocked that a Jain monk would be a painter. This happened more than once, although not that often. In this case, the thoughtful organization of the paintings and their economy within the manuscript in relation to the story and the facing text on each page support this hypothesis. Their arrangement is not mechanical. The pictures have various sizes and formats and the available space is made use, is made use of thoughtfully throughout. Various observations suggest that the painter had full control on the manuscript space and on his pictorial agenda. The overall impression is that this Rupa Vijaya was keen on leaving his mark on the true artifact he achieved, both in writing a very correct text and painting nicely. At the top of the picture, two pure souls are depicted. This will be Prince Singhala's destiny once he gets emancipation, along with his brother in the previous birth. But before that, he has a very long way to go, and this is what the story is about. Devotion to Parshvanat and to Saraswati is an auspicious beginning. The goddess is worshipped on the picture by a Shwetambara Jain monk holding a rosary in a respectful attitude. He, he is the author, Samaya Sundar, who in the text says, I bow down the feet of the good teacher. I have goddess Saraswati in mind. In order to elucidate the right practice of gift, I will narrate an interesting story. In the world, famous stories on gift are always listened to. Priya Melaka, which is not well known, is a very good narrative. This is what he writes. Unfortunately, words only, no picture, tell us the starting episodes as page two of the manuscript is missing. It would have contained a depiction of the joyful atmosphere of spring, forests in bloom, the earth filled with fragrance, bees humming, Indian cuckoos singing, cowards singing, musicians playing drums and other instruments, dancers, celebration of holy with red powder, all this summed up in the Gujarati sentence, Nagara Mahi, Saku Nara Nari, Ananda Krida Kare Apara. All men and women in the city play with boundless joy. It would also have shown young Prince Singhala entering the forest, hearing the pitiful cries of young Dhanavati, daughter of Nagarshet Dhana, as she had been seized by, by a wild elephant and coming to her rescue. This event led to festivities organized by the Nagarshet and his assistants to celebrate Singhala and to the sending of envoys to his father in this scene where all the characters, you may notice, are men. This culminates in the wedding ceremony of Singhala and Dhanavati, which is led by a Brahmin. He has the ritual fire in front of him while the couple hold hands. The Purna Kalasha with exuberant vegetation is an auspicious symbol, while a drummer, a trumpet or Chennai player and a cymbal player convey the joyful atmosphere. The painting on the right could be an emblematic representation of a royal couple signifying the accomplishment of Singhala's marriage with Dhanavati and their happy life. This, however, was not to last. Singhala's extreme beauty was so attractive for the ladies of the town that it was regarded as disturbing. A delegation of officials asked the king, his father, to prevent the prince from going out. Feeling insulted, Singhala left in order to test his own karma, 
ಕರಮ ಪರೀಕ್ಷಕರನ ಕುಮಾರ ಚಲ್ಯಾವುದಿ ಅಕಂಪನೀಡ್ ಬೈ ಧನವತಿ ಹೂ ಇನ್ಸಿಸ್ಟೆಡ್ ಆನ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ಹಿಮ್ ಆಸ್ ದ ಟ್ರಾವೆಲ್ ಬೈ ಬೋಟ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರಾಂಗ್ ರಿಸಲ್ಟೆಡ್ ಇನ್ ಶಿಪ್ ರೈಕ್ ಧನವತಿ ಮ್ಯಾನೇಜ್ಡ್ ಟು ರೀಚ್ ದ ಸೀ ಶೋರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟು ಕ್ರಿಫ್ಯೂಟ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಟೆಂಪಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಯಕ್ಷ ಪ್ರಿಯಮಲಕ ಲವ ಯುನೈಟೆಡ್ ಐ ಕ್ಯಾನಾಟ್ ಶೋ ಯು ದಿಸ್ ಈವೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಪಿಕ್ಚರ್ ದೇ ವುಡ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಬಿನ್ ಪೇಟನ್ ಆನ್ ಪೇಜ್ ಫೋರ್ ವಿಚ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಅನ್ಫಾರ್ಚುನೇಟ್ಲಿ ಬೀನ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಸಿನ್ಸ್ ಲಾಂಗ್ ಸೊ ಟೂ ಪೇಜಸ್ ಅನ್ಫಾರ್ಚುನೇಟ್ಲಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಬಿನ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಬಟ್ ಬಿ ಶೋ ದರ್ ಆರ್ ಸೋ ಮೆನಿ ಅದರ್ ಪೇಜಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಲ್ಲಸ್ಟ್ರೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಆಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಸಿಂಗಲ ಹಿ ಮ್ಯಾನೇಜ್ ಟು ರೀಚ್ ದ ಸಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ರತ್ನಪುರ ವೇ ಆರ್ ಲಿವ್ ಕಿಂಗ್ ರತ್ನಪ್ರಭ ಕ್ವೀನ್ ರತ್ನ ಸುಂದರಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದರ್ ಬ್ಯೂಟಿಫುಲ್ ಡಾಟರ್ ರತ್ನವತಿ ರತ್ನವತಿ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಬೀನ್ ಬಿಟನ್ ಬೈ ಅ ಸ್ನೇಕ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಾಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಟು ಡೈ ದಿ ಆಥರ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ರೈಬ್ಸ್ ಡ್ರಾಮೆಟಿಕಲಿ ಓಲ್ ದ ಕ್ಯೂಸ್ ದಟ್ ವರ್ ಅಟೆಂಪ್ಟೆಡ್ ಬಟ್ ಫೇಲ್ಡ್ ದೆನ್ ದ ಪ್ರಿನ್ಸ್ ಇಂಟರ್ವೀನ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಆಥರ್ ಸೇಜ್ ದ ಪ್ರಿನ್ಸ್ ಹೂ ವಾಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಕ್ಯೂರಿಯಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ವೇಸ್ ಕೀನ್ ಟು ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಟಚ್ ದ ಡ್ರಮ್ ವಿತ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಓನ್ ಹ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ದ ಟ್ರೂ ಸಕ್ಸೆಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಫ್ಯೂಚರ್ ಆಫ್ ಗುಡ್ ಮೆನ್ ದ ಪ್ರಿನ್ಸ್ ವಾಸ್ ಬ್ರೋಟ್ ಟು ದ ಪ್ರಿನ್ಸಸ್ ಸೈಡ್ ಪ್ಯೂರ್ ವಾಟರ್ ವಾಸ್ ಬ್ರೋಟ್ he soaked his, his ring in it sprinkled the princess's body over whole he lovingly made her drink the water she immediately got up and sat on her own the prince had given help the father's joy had no limit end of quote the prince here has taken the uh, the drum and he's holding the hand of a man of apparently lower uh, social condition who is likely to be the town crier the frequent this frequent narrative motif means accepting to take up a challenge after having offered his services to a king's official he is seen holding the hand of the princess who then shows her gratitude this is conclu- concluded by singala's second marriage in the top part a large bed is shown but is empty the prince is lying down on the ground his wife ratnavati is kneeling in front of him the poet says night fell the sun set young love awakened the palace was magnificent as if it were in draz mansion an excellent bed was spread covered with numerous fine layers of cloths the prince and his wife uh, the prince left the bed and slept on the ground with her here the prince and his wife are taking talking to each other the author goes on Ratnavati was puzzled by her husband's behavior. She lovingly asked him, "Who oh, husband, disclose your secret." The prince reflected that truth should not be told to ladies, in particular when it relates to a co-wife, and thus explained that he had taken the resolution to keep to celibacy until he would be re- reunited with his parents. But the next day, he told his true story to the king. as shown here in the lower compartment throughout singhala's hidden desire is to be re- reunited with his first wife but before this new adventures await him peaceful reconciled married life is perhaps conveyed here by ratnavati messaging her husband's feet but preparations for returning to singhala's homeland are being actively discussed Singhala and Ratnavati with a female friend take leave from the king and undertake another sea travel. An important visual element seems to be missing here. The author says that the couple had been granted a chaplain Purohita as an escort. This chaplain is in fact a villain who strongly desires Ratnavati and wishes to get rid of Singhala. He manages to throw him into the sea then pretending to be utterly sad. but singhala is rescued by a four-handed figure whom you see in the uh, at the bottom here uh, somebody according to the text who later appears to be a helping deity the author says the princess caught a piece of wood and swiftly went to the water bank she reached Pri- priyamelaka tirtha unfortunate full of sorrow and this is shown here in the uh, bottom part of the left picture On the other hand three hindu ascetics a senior one and two young boys represent the hermitage where where the somebody took the prince shown first in the upper left image 
and then on the right side, when he weds the daughter of the main Hasidic of the Hermitage. So Rupavati becomes his third wife. The couple is surrounded by pundits holding manuscripts who lead the ceremony. Singhala and his new wife tenderly look at each other. Their hand gesture is a way to represent the Parnigrahana. Facing them is the ritual fire. The new couple departs again, this time not by sea but by air, as they have been presented with a magic flying bed by the girl's father, who had also offered them a rag dispensing 100 coins a day. The prince and his wife have now landed in a park. A thirsty Rupavati said, Get me water to drink. I am thirsty. I cannot bear it one second more. My throat is dry. My body burns. I cannot use my tongue to speak. So Singhala left her alone and went. But as he was drawing water from a well, a snake spoke in human voice and said, Pull me out. Be helpful. The prince acted as he was asked to. The snake transformed himself in, uh, sorry, the snake transformed him into an ugly a hunchback, but promised that he would be present to assist when Singhala falls into difficulties. The prince, as a hunchback, went back to his wife with a bowl of water. She did not recognize her husband. Who is this hunchback man? I don't stay near a man other than my husband, and turned her back on him, as shown in the lower compartment of the left side picture. The couple on the cot conveys happy moments of their lives, whereas in sharp contrast, the lower image shows separation caused by estrangement. Rupavati then ran about everywhere in despair and finally took refuge at Priyamela Katirtha, where she joined Simhala's first two wives. All three ladies observed penance and kept to obstinate silence. The king of Kusumapura came to know about this and was intrigued. The king got the drum taken around. Listen, all of you. I will give my daughter to the man who makes these young ladies speak. The dwarf man touched the drum. He arrived near the king. Singhala, as a hunchback, but not depicted as such, touches the drum. The other th scenes seem to condense the whole episode, but all details are not fully clear. The Yaksha Priyamelaka, a four-handed figure with a Jinnah-like face, is assisted by a special devotee who, the author says, welcomes the new ladies and provides food appropriate for their penance. Singhala's three wives have taken refuge there. The king, fanned by an attendant, observes them with a hand gesture, signifying astonishment in front of their persisting silence. Together with ministers and other officials, he has come with the hope that Singhala will force the three ladies to speak. The prince is seated in front of a book stand and gestures toward the manuscript with blank pages and no letters, pretending to read. The first day he narrates the beginning of Dhanavati's story as a teaser and concludes this much for now, explaining that he will continue the next day. This induces Dhanavati to speak. The same scenario is repeated the following day with the adventures of Ratnavati. The prince closes the book, Ratnavati speaks. On the third day, the prince does the same with Rupavati, who cannot remain silent any longer. Singhala now asks the king for the promised reward, namely marrying Princess Kusamavati. The pictorial language of the wedding ceremony is the same as in other similar scenes. The new couple hold hands while two Brahmins lead the ritual. And you see again the Purna Kalasha here. The next line of the picture shows the young couple now married. The snake is the farewell present offered by Singhala's brother-in-law. It immediately bites Singhala, who faints. But the deity appears and restores the fainted hunchback to a beautiful prince whom his first three wives now recognize and his fourth one can admire. Joyful celebrations can now take place. Now Singhala is ly lying on a bed uh, yeah, uh, after having enjoyed uh, pleasures with his four wives. Facing him, 
is the 400 deity who has acted as a helping figure throughout his life. The prince, uh, this scene marks the beginning of the dialogue between the prince and the deity. The prince asked, who are you? Why did you help? The god said, I am a deity named Naga Kumara. When the prince wishes to know more about their mutual connection, the deity embarks upon narrating their common previous birth. The deity now starts telling the story of Singhala's previous birth. Here, his then father, uh, Sir Dananjaya, the cha champion of Donos to Jain monks, and his then mother are seated in the mansion. On the other hand, a Shwetambara Murtipujak monk, clearly identified as, as such by his monastic equipment, white dress, red coated arms ball, and staff, Danda, is shown wandering. When he reaches the merchant's house, in order to break his fast, Parna, the couple's two sons, one of them Singhala, the other one the deity, offer proper food to him. Supatra Dana is one of Singhala's manifestations of virtue, but in his previous birth, his sincerity was broken at the time of giving. This is what accounted for the separations he had to endure all along. Another virtue of his is compassion, shown in the lower image. While the Kusum Kusumapura king wants to condemn the villain to death, Singhala decides to set him free. The prince, who has now overcome all the tests and trials put in front of him, wishes to remain attached to his parents' feet again. The daughters-in-law show respect to Singhala's mother. The prince, sitting with his four wives, embodies the image of perfect happiness. Now in charge of the, king, of the kingdom which his father has entrusted to him, he leads the life of a perfect Jain king, ensuring that nobody lives in poverty. From Kusumavati's father, he had got a kind of magic rag as farewell gift. Each and every second, the text says, the king beats the rag. Plenty of cowries tinkle. He made the hearse bereft of death. He offered cowries of wealth as gift. And this is, this is the white thing which you see in the right-hand image. The king manipulates the object in some way. Three running lads below represent the common people who benefit from it. Once again, the king acts as a generous donor, using for the benefit of others the magic object originally intended for his own pleasure. Examples of King Singhala's involvement in pious activities appropriate for a Jain layman are shown here. He is worshipping a decorated Jina image set in a large temple niche with one of his wives while one of his wives finds the, the image. Below, both husband and wife listen to the teaching of a senior monk. On the small vignette, both husband and wife are now in simple clothes without any ornament and stand in Kayotsarga. This is the way to represent their practice of Poshadha, where lay people temporarily give up their ordinary way of life and signs of social status to approach as much as possible the condition of mendicants. Later on, Singhala is reborn as a god in the Saudharma heaven. The facing Apsaras signifies the life of pleasure he enjoys. He will then become a pure soul, having reached emancipation. To wrap up, just a few remarks. In the manner of a folk tale, the structuring motives are a departure that leads to various travels before final return to the native place. Each episode is an occasion for the hero to show his value and get new acquisitions, here in the form of wives. In the passage from one stage to the other, the hero's will is one factor, the other one comes from external circumstances or pressure which cause both breaks and progress. He is threatened by a negative hero who was originally supposed to be a helper, but assisted by an anonymous rescuing and apparently ambivalent character which reveals its true identity only when the trials have come to an end. The biting snake reveals its identity as a god and changes the hunchback to his usual self. Finally, this deity is also the mediator who acts as the omniscient explaining figure providing to Singhala the account of his previous birth. This is a variation of the more common scenario where the apparent mysteries of ups and downs 
are disclosed by the Jain monk. Generosity and care for others are two val values that are variously underlined in the story through the deeds of Singhala. Proper gift to monks is the main motif of his previous birth and the characteristic of his family. Beyond that, helpfulness, upakara, is consubstantial to Singhala and functions as a red thread. On the other hand, faithfulness to one's beloved is a feature of the three ladies who stay at the lover united, uh, united sacred place and behave as perfect satis. Persisting silence is the adequate strategy they use as uh, when they are unprotected. To some extent, faithfulness also emerges as a man's quality. Ultimately, the main purpose of the hero's quest is to be reunited with his first wife, even if achieving this aim implies gaining additional wives. He will remain chaste until his quest is over. In addition, clearly Jain teaching is imparted not through didactic presentations, but through the description of the ideal behavior of characters. The arrival of a Jain monk is the starting point for a detailed portrait of monastic conduct. The lay counterpart is found in the portrait of Singhala as a king who guarantees security and non-killing, Amari, during pollution, engages in religious activity, and spends, and spends money in proper ways. This double exposition, monk-layman, combined with the praise of dana by layman to monks, and the extolling of sati behavior is an adequate way to aim at an audience comprising all members of the Jain Chaturvidha Sangha, monks, nuns, laymen, laywomen, and thus is meant to appeal to all. Thank you very much. We've got about 10 minutes for questions. Is there anyone here who'd like to ask a question? I see one hand up here. Hello, Nalini. Thank you very much for this presentation. I actually have two questions, if I may. Okay, so first question um, relates to what you said in the beginning, that this uh, manuscript was painted by a monk. So I'm wondering if we know something about where they learned this before or after um, uh, Diksha, and um, you know how, how, how they would learn the, the specific style of the region, etc., in relation to that. My second question is about narratives, because I know uh, you know <laughs> a lot about this. So, whether there are differences between um, narratives from the Shvetambara and, and Digambara tradition besides. Um, the, the, the vows, besides like these very specific sectarian elements. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I wish I could ans answer the first question because I would like myself to know how you know the monks could uh, learn this um, this uh, art of painting. But anyway, you know there are some uh, evidence in colophon in manuscript colophons which are clear that the manuscripts were painted by monks. I mean, it's not very frequent, but it may, it may um, happen. And in this case, I am not quite totally sure that it is the case. But what happens is that the, in the colophon, um, it is written that Rupa Vijaya, I mean, it was Lipikritam and Likitam by Rupa Vijaya. So since there are two uh, words, you know, I thought that this could be one argument in favor of uh, taking Rupa Vijaya as the painter and the copyist. And more even, even more than that, I mean, what I said about the way the, the, text, the text and the pictures are, you know, organized in the, in the manuscript uh, is very thoughtful. And, for example, the letters are not obscured by the painting and things like that. So, I mean, one gets the impression that the, uh, one person did everything very skillfully. So, but I don't know about, I mean, I cannot, cannot really reply to the question, where did they learn that and how and uh, was it after Diksha or before Diksha, but... Uh, I mean, we, we have some examples like that, but I don't know, maybe some other people have uh, ideas about that, but I don't know. I cannot, uh, yeah. To answer that first question, right, where did they learn, right? Uh, the, current, the current education system where we are being taught, right, it's very perfect. Like, you know, books, study that, by heart that, give the answers, that's fine. But what Adishwar Bhagavan taught that Bhutir Kala, 72 and 64, yeah. right? So every 
child that gets education in 16th century 17th century they have to go and learn all this uh, paintings they do also the silai even you know here uh, it's like women does the cooking no when adishwar dada uh, there were like uh, young males also used to do the cooking so all this kala and artistic and painting has been like taught from the r- 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 long years No, but current education has changed so no but i mean the, this list of 60 64 72 colors i mean is there that is true but we don't know i mean in practice you know how it was uh, managed by people i mean this is true that uh, many youths uh, could have learned several uh, several of these uh, crafts uh, but i mean there is no precise information about how uh, a monk could have really learned it or maybe he had learned it in his earlier life uh, before diksha uh, but i mean we don't really know And about your second question, do you mean what is the difference between Shwetambara and Digambara stories, basically? Or well, I, I would say that I mean it depends on the it depends, you know, on the period, on the purpose of the story, on the um, also languages used, and so on. Here we have an example of a Gujarati story uh, which was composed in the 17th century. So it uses, I mean, the Gujarati poetry uh, form of Chaupai. uh with refrains and different meters and all that uh but the, actually the contents of the story was not invented by samaya sundara there are some pre- uh, there are some stories earlier in sanskrit and in prakrit uh in some collections which follow exactly the same where well, i mean the same line is followed uh, like here uh, but otherwise you know here uh, you have the um, you have i think the combination of a folk tale with all the structures i mean the motifs and all that with some um, clearly uh, jain teaching being uh, imparted inside and also there is a telling of the previous birth story by some omniscient type of being which is here not a jain monk but which is this uh, yaksha i mean this uh, deity which uh, uh, was there in the previous birth of singhala too so i i mean it's very i don't think there are really actually very di- different um, differences which are which can be termed as a shwetambara stories and the digambara stories there is a lot a lot of material which is common but then it depends in the uh, the way of telling the stories and the context also where the stories are told uh thank thank you very much prof balbir that was really superb um i i just wondered what would have been the function of uh th- this sort of manuscript so of course the manuscript in some ways it's to preserve the stories on one level but at the time um would it have been the equivalent of us watching television in the yes, evening yeah. and I mean, in a way yeah entertainment is, or what would have been the yeah, function yeah this is why you know in the beginning i tried to say that at that time i mean manuscript was a kind of media and it was a kind of media which contained both text and illustrations and then about this specific manuscript i don't know but there are some examples which are known of manuscripts which are you know uh, with illustrations which are shown for example in temples on some festival days so i mean there is a, a guru or i mean somebody who shows the manuscript to the audience they read or narrate the text orally and they show the pictures at the same time so it is like a kind of a cartoon if you want to say or a kind of um, book you know illustrated book uh, which can be used for personal reading uh, for preserving the heritage of course but for personal reading and also sometimes for collective reading in the uh, i mean context of ceremonies or festivals things like that thank you just one quick question um, yeah. with the writing some of it's in black and some of it's in red ink Do you know why that was done? Well, I mean this was something which was done um, very often in paper manuscripts uh, and so here also this is interesting what what you say because here the use of red and black is very is done rather systematically. But this is not as an exceptional case in the fact in the sense that uh, in um, manuscripts especially in, I mean manuscripts in different languages uh, this red is used for sometimes verse numbers for some uh, refrains uh, in the poetry you know some uh, recurring phrases which are used uh, in the poetry so it is it is used to mark some difference uh, in the type of text or in the type of meter which is used but here it is done very systematically and this is one more um, detail which uh, shows that this manuscript was done in a very thoughtful way by whoever uh, did it you know. 
Any other questions? Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you for your interesting presentation. And um, so at a certain point, you mentioned um, uh, in the, the story of Samir Sundar, that, um, um, uh, written by Samir Sundar, that uh, Simhara was bitten by this uh, snake and then turned into this ugly hunchback. And that really felt like, came across as really familiar, like it's sort of very, is that sort of like a common motif? Because it reminded me of the, um, the story of Nala and Damayanti in the Mah Mahabharata, where uh, Nala is bitten by the snake Karkotaka and is turned into uh, an ugly hunchback. Mm. So it's a like, very common yeah, trope and motif throughout yeah. literature and or, um, yeah. Well, yeah, well, actually, you know, in this uh, story, uh, you can, uh, there, this motif, I mean, which you mentioned, and this reference is uh, quite relevant, but there are many, it is made of different motifs which can be found in other uh, uh, passages, I mean, other, other texts, because these are motifs which are also characteristic of folk tales, you know, and so this motif is, um, uh, is there, but I mean, there are other motifs too which can be found in other texts. So I think these these are kind of classical motifs of folk tales, you know, and then they are used in a classic uh, rewritings or classical uh, epics or whatever text it is uh, in in different contexts. So I don't think they belong to a specific text. Actually, they are more part of a kind of pool of motifs which can be used in different contexts by the storytellers, whether they are the epic uh, authors, I mean, or, so to say, authors, or whether it is. Uh, in the 17th century and so on. Any other questions? <coughs> got, we've got a couple minutes. If anyone's got any burning questions they'd like to ask. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Nalini. This was a beautiful presentation. I just wanted to know whether the artists make several copies because it can be used for private use and for temple use. And whether the uh, copies that are made are identical to whatever original that was used. Hmm. Well, I mean, it's very difficult to know. I mean, for, there are different copies of, the, of this text, of course. But uh, there are, I don't uh, think there are different copies of the same manuscript. I mean, at least I have not been able to trace any. You know. uh, so whether different copies of one uh, same manuscript were made, like you mean like uh, in the printing process where multiple copies are made, I, I don't know, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, it's very difficult to, to answer this. <laughs> Anyone else? Any other questions? Yeah, yeah sure, of course. Hello, Nalini. That was Hello. a wonderful lecture. You. you mentioned Gujarati. Yes. Uh, is there any material that I that is available in Gujarati to read? Uh, you that mean you know of? For example, of, for this story, or yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I mentioned in the first slide uh, this t the the text has been edited actually. Um, the text has been edited by uh, Bhamvarlal Nahta, Samaya Sundar Ras Panchaka. So this is the original text of the story. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, there are some um, English or Gujarati uh, renderings yeah. uh, in some uh, um, anthologies of stories, like Jain stories, you know, by my, some uh, uh, monks and so on. Also the tropais that you mentioned? This, this tropai, I mean, uh, this tropai, this is the original text of the tropai, okay. which is in Gujarati. And then with this edition, you have a Hindi summary of a few pages. Okay. Yeah, but the tropa itself has not been translated into uh, modern Gujarati or Hindi or English, to my uh, to my knowledge. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And actually, I intend to. I mean, maybe it's a dream or it's a plan. I don't know. But uh, I would like to um, make a kind of comparative study of uh, this uh, story in its illustrated manuscripts, because uh, you know there are some mentions of other illustrated manuscripts of the same story, uh, which I have not yet uh, seen. And uh, it would be interesting to see, you know, how the, the pictures are different or similar, uh, based on be, uh, being known that it is based on the same text. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you very much, Professor Nalini Bobir, for taking us through that.